All right, first of all, I want to say thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. The one thing that people may or may not know about you is, and, the, and this is one, kind of the one thing that um, that always kind of stuck with me about you, was that you, before Facebook, before MySpace, before any of that stuff, you had Romad.com. You stood that up. Yep. And that was before, I mean, that's back when we didn't know anything about the internet. internet. You know, I, yeah, I, I, we were clueless. Right. And you, right. you had, not only did you have like, you know, cool pictures or like, just updates about the career field, but you, you had like a message board and people could talk. And I, I talked to people on there that I heart that I never get to see, you know, it was, it was yep. and now it's, of course, it's, it's the norm to do that kind of thing. But you were, oh, yeah. you were one of the pioneers of that thing. And I know we'll talk about it later, but I, I was, I just wanted to get that out first. Cause you were like, you were the man in that regard. You were way ahead of everybody on that, on that front. Yeah. After Al Gore invented the internet quote, <laughs> right. Uh, <yeah. laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, so like I said, I was reading through your bio and it's just fascinating. Let's start from the beginning. Talk about how, you know, you got in the military, talk about your early life, that kind of thing. And, and we'll just go from there. So I was a military brat. My mom was a comm center uh, um, operator. My dad actually ran the comm center. So, you know, I've been in communications before I was alive. Uh, so as it were, um, Moved across the planet. I was born in Spain, which makes it interesting yeah. because I'm a naturalized citizen, you know, the whole thing. Um, brother was born in the UK, so even more interesting. <laughs> and then finally, we ended up bouncing across the United States. Lived in Hawaii for a number of years. That was, as a young guy, that wasn't a big deal. But I've been back since, and I would never want to live in Hawaii. I mean, it yeah. was all right for the for the extra things you can do. But, I mean, you can drive around the island in 15 minutes. It's just, right. it's nuts. So, yeah. And back then, some of those roads weren't even completed, uh, like the road that's around the North Shore. That was all gravel. Jeez. So we'd ride our bikes up there and go surfing. We had special racks that so we'd put on our bikes for that. Um, kind of go a long time. I, w I exited high school. I was a certified mechanic in AISE because uh, they were doing that kind of stuff in high school. I knew I wasn't going to college because I just didn't have the funding for that. Uh, so I became a, a mechanic and then a dealership mechanic who did you know, car racing on the side with dragsters and stuff. But um, once Carter Economics hit the town, it essentially imploded it. Um, the hospital was laying people off. It was that bad. Jeez. So, you know, I had the, I, I understood how the military worked. I understood how the right structure worked. So I joined. And it was, you know, kind of obvious to join the Air Force versus the other ones. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, that. No <laughs> offense to any, <laughs> anybody else, but yeah. Yeah, and that whole, that whole trope of me, you know, that's oh, I joined the <laughs> army. That, but but I think it was interesting because you know I joined with a guaranteed job as a mechanic, and I get the basic training, and they're like, "Yeah, that's not going to happen. We've got too many mechanics. We're going to put you as a vehicle operator." I'm like, all right, well, I'm like that can't be horrible, but that kind of sucks. You know, you're essentially in breach of contract, and they're like, "Well, if you want to get out of it, that's fine. We'll we'll cut you free right now." But uh, yeah, no. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the town the town was literally unmanned, so it was like no, I ain't going back to that. Yeah, and it was just my father had retired in Kentucky, um, in between Louisville and Frankfort, small town called Shelbyville, and so I finished high school and all everything there and, and did mechanic stuff there. Uh, but at some point, it's like now nah, gotta go. So mm -hmm. you know, joined the military. I ended up as a the AFSC used to be called six hundred three. Um. What it is now, I don't know, nor yeah. care to even look it up. <laughs> right. But the, my problem was, because um, I was so lean forward, go figure stuff out, um, I was qualified to drive every single vehicle the Air Force had in the first 18 months of my career in the Air Force. Nice. So it's like, you know, well, what am I going to do now? I'm, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a one-striper, and uh, I, you know, I know how to drive everything. And now I'm teaching the Command Vehicle Operators Training Course tractor trailer and i'm nuclear certified to haul uh air launch cruise missiles and and straight up uh, gravity bombs nuclear gravity bombs what do i do so i ended up going to off it to meet my you know the top chief in the community and he's doing you know computer work vehicle you know management stuff and i'm like yeah no i'm no <laughs> I, it's going to take me forever to get to there and i've already seen it and i'm not impressed yeah so one of my counterparts in the in the building in tech because i went my first duty station was um carswell air force base texas it was a sac base we thought the sac stood for stuck at carswell <laughs> but the um so we i get there and i meet all these people and then one of them is leaving for the 275 course 
And he comes back, he's not a happy camper. He hated it. <laughs> and I was a natural runner. So, you know, I'd run, you know, 10, 15 miles on a weekend just for, you know, just because. And he comes back and he's like, oh, they're running and doing this. And I was like, oh, running. I'm in. <laughs> so I went and signed up the next day. And uh, I left for the course like two weeks later, Hawk 18. And, uh, man, that was a blast. That was yeah. best crew ever. The We started with 15 guys. One was a conscience rejector. So automatically day one was 14. <laughs> we, get, um, we get about a month into the course, and there's only four of us left. Jeez. Paul Gayhart, um, Wayman Perry, Spanky Davis, and me. And uh, Chief, well, so, you know, road guards. Yeah. You got to have your road guards. Right. How many road guards are there? There are four. Sure. So we were all wearing road guard vests. So <laughs> Falcon Flight runs in front of us. You know, the, they got 40-something people in that, that class, and they go yeah. cruising in front of us through this intersection. We're between the two flights. So the four of us come racing in. We replace the road guards that are there, do a five count, and then we take off running when the next <laughs> crew comes in. Well, unbeknownst to us, Chief Finn was in the cars that were waiting for us to cross. <laughs> so we get back to the room or back to the class, and we get shouted at for like 15 minutes. And finally, Paul's like, uh, we were doing exactly what you told us to do. Yeah. All formations have to have road guards. We have road guards. <laughs> He's like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do two things. You guys are going to be accelerated. You're going to continue to go. Because we were all, uh, I'd made Buck Sergeant while I was down back when they had Buck Sergeant. Yeah, yeah. So I got notified the first two weeks I was there that I made Buck Sergeant. But to be perfectly honest, the test isn't that hard for truck, you know, for vehicles. Sure. You just need to know the forms and all that. So I get notified while I'm there. And uh, all of us are NCOs. I think uh, Gayhart was a staff. I think uh, Wayman was a staff too. But he's like, I'm. I'm not going to hold you guys. You're going to do a block test every week. So every Friday you have a block test. Wow. So we graduated the day after Falcon Flight. Jeez. So they graduated on a Friday. They got their their certs. We graduated the next day. You know, for us doing you know movement and road movement, and all that was was zero effort. So. Sure. Well, Falcon flight, Eagle flight, fall out on the road for PT, Hawk flight, fall out on my car, was what Charlie <laughs> or Reardon used to do. Right. So we'd hop in the back of Charlie's car, and him and Randy Horn, who is the fastest bastard I've ever known, yeah. would get out and flog the shit out of us on the beach. <laughs> so it got to be, you know, after the first couple of times that happened, uh, we all do a little powwow beforehand. One guy volunteers to tackle Randy right off the, right off the bat. <laughs> So we're off. I'm the I'm the fastest guy in the crew. So literally, I'm you know get set ready go, and I'm gone. And Gayhart's tackling Randy into the surf, or you know burying him in the sand. Right. If I get about halfway down the track, uh, down the down the beach because we were running to the piers, uh -huh. and uh, you know I hear that that panting breath line is <laughs> like fuck. <laughs> Because because if we lost now it's another hour or something. You know, oh yeah, and, and sugar cookies out there. So sure, like, I have got to get to the get there before the that my heart didn't explode was kind of a surprise. <laughs> right. But uh, so I exit from that. I go to my first duty station is Fort Carson, Colorado. Fantastic installation. Mm. Um. So I'm a shiny new asshole out of the course. Right. I, I of course know everything. Sure. And, you know, I, I, I'm working for um, Lamont Anderson, who used okay. to be an 11 Bravo. Outstanding individual. Can't beat him. I mean, he's a great leader. And I and I asked him about the third day there. I'm like, what's with these shitbag ALOs? Their uniforms are all crappy. Their boots are dirty, blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of went through a litany. And he's like, hmm. He said, have you ever heard, heard of this book? And it was um, Christopher Robbins, Over the Treetops. He said, I'm going to loan it to you. You go read it tonight. But let me let me take you a, a cruise around. He said, see that dude over there? He's He was um, flying over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He's in the book. He's the um, teetotaling um, Mormon. And, he's, and he goes around. All the ALOs we had were Vietnam guys. Jeez. From, from low-level aircraft. You know, they're firing rifles out the window kind of thing. Jeez. None of them were shiny new guys. Uh, so he's like... 
what you need to do is you need to hit these guys up and talk to them and figure out the tactics that they used and understand what's going on because no matter what happens, that stuff's going to come back around. We're going to be doing that again. And you've, and you've seen it your, in your career where the old ways are now the new ways. You know, it's the same thing. Nothing's changed. Yeah. And when you get down to start talking now of going, well, we're, we don't have enough fighters to do training, so we're going to grab these small prop jobs. Mm-hmm. Same kind of process, same kind of thought thing. You know, yep. that's, you just got to extend everything out. So that was a reality check. Um, <laughs> but after that, I'll tell you, those, you know, I've, I've read every, just about, almost positive, I've read every single book about that era, uh, looking for the individuals that were there. I mean, mm-hmm. we've got, we had a, a major that was the senior, senior major in the Air Force through some kind of thing that he did. It was a, it was an F-111 driver, as I recall. Mm-hmm. Through something that he did, he was never going to get promoted to lieutenant colonel no matter what. So he was the senior major. <laughs> and that used to be fun to take him into the talk. And, you know, hey, this is my major. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. After my kids were very young, so I volunteered for Korea to get that completely out of the way. Sure. Uh, I did a year and something in Korea uh, at, at Camp Casey. Um, Robbie Johnson. Uh, there's a whole bunch. There's a whole stack of dudes that were up there with me. Ken Haskell. Um, well, anyway, there's a whole stack of dudes that were up there with me whose names are escaping me right this second. Yeah. But the um, but the cool thing was going back and forth to the Z and supporting those guys. I supported the Rock Ranger course, doing some things over there. Uh, Ron Myers had just graduated the course, so I was interested in seeing what that was all about. Sure. I've never seen a obstacle course run up the side of a mountain at a 40 degree angle before. That was impressive. <laughs> Yeah, and those and those guys get the shit beat out of them. Yeah. I mean, if if you interview Ron Myers, I mean, ask him about Rock Ranger School. That oh, I'd love to. Doing it, they're being clubbed. It's not you know shouting; it's clubbing because yeah. you know the Rock Ranger, the the Rock Army is not volunteers. They they're conscripted, so yeah, you had to motivate guys to be in that. Sure. Um, so Korea, I got a whole bunch of controls out of. Uh, because I would, I just didn't want to be around the building. So mm-hmm. me and a couple other guys kind of got into a rotation where we were just going out on, on Scorpion's Tail and up in uh, Papa 5-9, I think it was, and just controlling the shit out of airstrike. So I got super amount of experience. And when the ALOs realize that you want to learn and understand, they're all over you. Now realize yeah. this was as an ETAC right. before pay. So oh, okay. when the pay started, because I was I was there when the SEI 914 came out, and everybody suddenly wanted to be ETAC qualified. Sure, it was, it was all it was all extra work before that, and nobody wanted the qual. Yeah. I always wanted to get out of the office, so yeah, I'm willing to go out and do this stuff. Um, a guy named Sanchez, uh, a couple different Sanchez's actually, but the this one was you know old in the tooth. Uh, he got he was at Utapau in 1965. For Vietnam as a staff sergeant, I met him as a staff sergeant. <laughs> so, so there was some, yeah. So there was some weird shit there. But uh, yeah. you know, um, so that's that's most of Korea is just going out and controlling airstrikes. You know, get up early in the morning, drive out there, do the airstrikes, and and then come back. Yeah. Um, came out of Korea, and I asked for Carson, uh, Benning, or any place I could go do something interesting and different because sure. you know. At that time, Fort Carson, Colorado, was uh, armor straight up. You know, it had it had some light light systems like the one thirteen, but it was mostly just tanks. The M sixty mm. tank at the time. Okay, they didn't have Abrams yet. So I get my orders, and it's Fort Drum. <laughs> I'm like, WTF? I, I yeah. remember hearing about Fort Drum. We were standing in the bay at Carson when that opened, and. Um, the chief, one of the chiefs comes out and he's like, Hey, that Nostein, Chief Nostein comes out and he's looking down at this paper and he's like, All right, there's a new fort opening, it's Fort Drum. Are there any volunteers? And he looks up, We're all gone. <laughs> as, as soon as he started talking, we knew what this was about. Yeah. All of us just we're, t- we're talking a vehicle bay, you know, a very long vehicle bay, you know, yeah. hangar type thing. There was not a one of us around, we were all you know, disappeared. Yeah, so I managed to dodge the bullet that time, but I didn't dodge the bullet coming out of, coming out of Korea. 
That's so, so odd that you didn't like because usually people get what they want out of Korea, but you got like the last thing you wanted. That's well, that's so odd. yeah. The interesting thing, and, and probably the most interesting thing, was that it was a whole different mission set. I mean, okay. armor, you grab your cooler and your lawn chair and all that, and you throw it in your truck, and that's how you do. Sure. It was exactly the opposite with, with light infantry. And the good thing was that when I got to ACC, those those things I learned there came into maximum use okay. because my enemy is not some guy in his pajamas running around with AK-47. My enemy is the weight of the shit that industry's given us right. and, that the, and that the Air Force is buying for us. So every single time when I get the, the ACC part, every single time I looked at something, it was how much does this weigh? How many batteries does this take? Yeah. You know, not not the level of training required to use it because that's you know weird for everything, but you know, how much does this thing weigh? Yeah. Five pounds is a lot after you know carried it for twenty hours. Uh, but so so light infantry. Uh, I worked for um, Carl Eikenberry. You may recognize that name. He ran mm -hmm. Afghanistan a number of years later when he had a whole bunch more stars. Sure. At that point, he was a lieutenant colonel. Um, nice guy. I mean, relatively speaking, to a colonel that was you know, running a whole bunch of cowboys at, <laughs> at 10th Mountain Division. All right. Um, that I communicated with him for a while, and then we kind of got out of touch. But uh, my father was diagnosed with cancer, so I got in a humanitarian. So I'm, I'm out of Fort Irwin, California. The family gets the diagnosis that, you know, it's, it's short time. Mm -hmm. That word gets the squadron commander. Squadron commander does a uh, humanitarian move that essentially picks me up and moves me. So I get back. The battalion went on block leave. The next day, my house is packed up and I'm gone. Wow. I mean, it was less than 24 hours. I was I was out of there and it was the recommendation was to send me to Fort Knox. Thankfully enough, that did not happen because mm -hmm. that would have changed the arc of my career completely. Sure. Uh, so I got Fort Campbell. So I get down, you know, I get in there and they finally figure out it's like, well, he has a lot more time left. So, you know, we're kind of backing off the emergency code. Okay. So I get to Fort Campbell. I'm working 101st Airborne Air Assault and they, they stick me uh, helping uh Petraeus so his battalion I'm, I'm not there for very long I was there for a pretty short time because they were kind of moving people around they were doing a reorg of the, of the squadron a bit because uh, we had just gotten in a whole new flight of young guys so they wanted to put them put them different places and Robert Serio either Robert Serio or Paul Ford was the lead of the uh the Rockassans so okay. I was like a third wheel sitting there but that was pretty short so I, I ended up going up with the air assault Working in the um, the ops building, you know, the ops part of it, the, the assault cock. So working there, and I'm back to being bored. This SF thing comes up, and Jim Price uh, was picked up, and so was Donnie Pugh mm -hmm. for the fifth group team, and so was um, uh, Chris Brewer. And the problem was they went through the initial stack, and they didn't get everybody they wanted. So they went through and they grabbed, like, I think it was 10 more guys. And I was part of that 10 more guys. So mm -hmm. I'm still within the the first grouping, but not the first pass. Sure. So I get picked up. Um, and after that, it was, you know, just add rockets to your, to your mobility. Because we had to do, because uh, fifth group's area is the, you know, Beautiful beach with no water. Right. That entire AOR was on fire. Shit was happening all over the place over there. Yeah. So what we started doing is three out, one in. So three guys out doing stuff, one guy back to do the battalion meetings or the, the group meetings and, and tie off to the ASOS. Because mm -hmm. we'd already been disconnected and sent to 2 ASOS at that point. Um, because we were supposed to be, quote, unquote, there for training, I was running cast classes all the time. Like every single day I had a, a new team in. We're doing cast classes, aircraft recognition, trying to get them to, up to at least they don't embarrass themselves, you know, out there doing right. stuff. So, but they immediately figured out that they could grab us and go do missions. So that happened within, you know, and it was not recommended, of course, by leadership. That, well, you guys are there for training. You're not supposed to be and we're like, look, the best place to train is out with them while they're doing stuff. 
That's right. So that's what we did. And then it, it immediately morphed over into, yeah, we're just doing stuff with them. Mm -hmm. We were still doing training just as a happenstance as what we do, you know, when, when somebody's whoppering around us. So we, we train the living shit out of those guys at fifth group. I was mostly aligned with uh, third battalion, but we rotate through because, you know, the availability of a person, here's a mission up that's first battalion. You know, you, you need to, you know, cross over and all that stuff. Sure. Um, we had a mix of quals. So Chris and Donnie were Halo guys. Um, Price and I were not. Mine was eyesight. I had the 200, 400 eyesight, so a bat can see better than me. <laughs> now I've gotten Lasix, which I wish was available back then. Right. Through Halo school. But um, for, whatever pre, uh, for whatever reason, Price didn't make it through Halo school. But they, they just wouldn't even let me go. I, mean, yeah. I told him I'd jump with a seeing eye dog, and when the slack came up in the leash, <laughs> right. I pulled. Oh, easy day. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, that's not doing it. Um, but as we continue to do things, we had all these advanced programs that were coming up. So DARPA guys would show up, and guys from NASA and guys from these, these uh, other governmental organizations with technology. And I ended up being the guy attached to that because of you know the stuff that I had going in the background. Romad.com was already out. That happened in 1990. That happened in Korea while I was there. I was doing the baseline work to get the IP address and all the things that you require for a domain. Back then, I mean, you can buy a domain name now for some. I was just going to say, I don't mean to cut you off, but people, I don't know, young guys might not understand that it's not It's not like just paying 1995 and getting a GoDaddy.com account. And then, like, I mean, you had to, like, probably. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you probably had to write some code and like do some, you yeah. had to really get in there and dig in. I mean, it was but, not easy so to the, stand up a website back then. Well, it, it was harder because the domain names were $300. Jeez. Because, you know, they had people, they had the bigs on there, so they could charge that kind of number. So, sure. Internet, the guys that were managing it at the time, you know, I sent a check to $300 to what I wanted. They sent me back all the rest of the pieces, and I'd gotten a, um, a domain is essentially bare metal, um, you know, that I could stuff all my stuff onto. And you're correct. I wrote a whole bunch of code that made Roman.com work, and I made it so that it would work on its own. Mm. So a lot of things that were happening were automated. That was by no means my first computer. Back when we lived in Hawaii, like I was talking about, uh, daycare wasn't a big thing. Right. I mean, it was literally, you know, there's supposed to be a parent in the home, and then you walk home from school, and or you take the bus and, you know, moms or dad is there. And no, uh, my dad worked in the comm center there. Uh, my mom was working elsewhere, mm -hmm. but I had, uh, so my first computer was a PDP 11. And you know what that is. If you're in a house. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> if, if, are you in a house? Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's a computer the size of your house would be my bet. <laughs> yeah. So it, and it had, uh, as I remember, it had a K, 1K of RAM. Um, the entry point was punch card. So I learned Fortran and COBOL <laughs> before I learned what a conjunction was in English. I didn't, That's you know, crazy. That, that kind of screws up how I do sentences and things like that. Thank <laughs> sure. God for Google correct and all that. <laughs> but so, so I understood two computer languages in their entirety before. And the cool thing was my dad didn't need to like manage me because he had all these, these young engineers that were working in the building there, uh, at Wheeler. And then the funny thing. Two doors down from the TAC B unit. No kidding. The only the only reason I know that is because they had 108s. And the the Chinaman hat, I still remembered that when I got to the schoolhouse. I'm like, so what that's what the hell that shit was. <laughs> <laughs> but so so I learned Fortran COBOL, computing languages that, that are um, that are very, you know, they're they're very structured. Mm -hmm. So my thought process have always been structured like that, where things happen, you know, event, things happen, event, things happen, event. Sure. Uh, doing punch cards and things like that you know and as computers have gotten smaller thankfully enough now we're you know now we're dealing with a phone right. that has 200 times more power than that thing <laughs> um but it was it was a good learning experience because i learned how machinery worked and communicate with other machinery yeah at the lowest level so i so i understood binary um and programming in uh, assembly language long before i you know was anything else but mm. Roll that forward to Roman.com. Now I've got this heavy metal that I can tell that into, and I can do things. And and you know, Roman.com came to came to fruition. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, it wasn't open uh, open bandwidth, so there was a limit to the amount of bandwidth you were allowed to use. Fast forward to 
the um, the war. Mm-hmm. So now we've got all these memes and shit, and I'm posting them on my website. What I did not know until I got that first three to five hundred dollar freaking bill for a month, <laughs> um, the the Navy had tagged my site as an informational source. <laughs> right so on. So now. All the, well, yes and no. I mean, it'd be cool if it was free, however, comma. So these guys are pulling the, essentially harvesting the site, pulling all the images down. Now do that for every single ship. Yeah. (laughs) That got ugly. But the kind of bridging around that, um, my code has always been written and my page has always been written to be low uh, bandwidth. Okay. So like when the guys were in the war and all that stuff, you know, all these different websites are out there, but they're very ungainly and chunky and all that. Mm-hmm. Romet.com was always designed for that deployed guy because I've been on the other side of the, the chain fence for that. Yeah. It's like, well, shit, this, you know, I can't even load the front page of this thing. So everything's always been simple and I still keep it that way for the existing Romet.com mm-hmm. that also has a secondary um, internet naming on it of joint terminal attack controller.com. So both lead to the exact same point on the server oh, okay uh at any particular time i've had between back in the day i had you know a couple hundred meg of things uh, i think the top was up to a terabyte that i've had on the back end okay of images history pdfs you know whatever else is in there just stored in the back end so it's all you know it all sits in the back of all of that uh makes it somewhat easier but it, it has always been an expensive thing i've never I've never once asked for money from anybody. You know, sure. people have said, oh, you can monetize it. And I was like, that's not the point. Right. The point, right. when I first got part of the community in 86, um, I'm like, this this place has a robust history. So I asked the historical association, hey, what do you got on this community? One page. Creation of the community, and it was only text. It didn't actually have the documentation for it. Wow. So I started printing out these huge reams of paper that had the names of people that I knew on it and names that people have sent and where they are, maybe some contact details. And I mailed that to all the units because at that time we were using DSN, you know, the phone network, sure. uh, digital subscriber network right. to talk to each other. So you had these islands and the problem was you'd learn something over at the Fort Bragg. I'd learned something over at Fort Drum those two storylines never matched over. So you may have something that will save lives and we don't know about it. Right. So a lot of it became exchanges of the, you know, the grunt guides is what we used to call them. Now mm-hmm. the crew, the crew guide. So we were exchanging all that stuff across romad.com once I stood it up. But in the meantime, you know, I sent all this documentation out and the comment I put on it is, you know, I, I would like to put a book together for this. Then I realized I, my English skills are not high enough, so we're, right. we're not going to do that. <laughs> but but I am a computer geek, so I can sure as hell put it up where other people can do and base like their data on it. Sure. So you know, I've been on I've been on there really many stuff. times. There uh, there was all kinds. Of, it's a wealth of information. You know, like how do I program this or what? Can, what's the where's the specs yep. on this piece of kit? And I mean, it was yeah, it was yep. fabulous. Well, I, I also had all the NSNs. Uh, it right. was tied by object and it was all searchable. Uh, there was, was tons of stuff on there. I can't even, that. yeah, we, we're not even yeah. scratching the surface. It was so great. Right. And the, the problem we have now is everything's gone to Facebook and mm-hmm. Facebook has a time to life on things. You know, they just kind of go away due to not touching them. Right. The thing you need to touch is something you don't remember anymore. And how do I go find that thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, thankfully enough, Google can now search all that. And I've made the, the back end, I put all the metadata together. So it allow the back end. To, to be searched by Google. So if you search for something, you know, a tech manual or something, it, it'll pop over to it and pull it either from me or some other people that are doing the same thing. Nice. The recent change I did, I wrote a whole bunch of code and now I have the names of people in there. You can click on it and, you know, there's the person's name. Here's where they were stationed during that period. You can go to that location. It'll show the other people that were there or had been there at that location. That's and cool. then the class, and then the pictures, and it, everything. I've tried to chain it together. Uh, I've been messing around with uh, a database called Neo4j, which is essentially not a relational database. It's more, uh, you know, a learned tree of knowledge. It's not AI, but it, it's structured in a way that things can be easily found because of their relationship, not because of their, like, naming. Oh, okay. You know, it, it's, it's pretty deep. Uh, it's quite fun to play with, but you know, sure. anyway. Um, so it's so, it's romad.com and it's joint it's 
JTAC spelled out. It's not JTAC. It's Joint Terminal Attack Controller dot com. Right. Okay. Yeah. And both there is are... another. Yeah. So TACP and JTAC also have all these other things like the TAC TACP moniker. There's a, a policeman's association that's tied to that. So oh, really? <laughs> what I, well, yeah. What I tried to do is I tried to make it so there was no doubt. This is what it is. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, but that one was a hell of a lot cheaper to get. I must say, yeah. that was uh, a <laughs> that was like eight eight bucks to get that wording. Nice. Uh, yeah. But um, where was I? Let's see. Campbell went through the SF part. I left there in '98. Uh, went to become the director of AGOS. So when it, I, I was a guy that helped stand it up at Nellis. We pulled it from Florida at that time. Um, it was some kind of golf game bet with between a couple of generals. Yeah. They needed. They, they, they said there was more assets at Nellis, and then there was at Florida, so you get more more air controls. Our training site was Fort Irwin, California, up at Leech Lake, up at the mm-hmm. top. So I did like forty nine rotations up in that shithole. Um, <laughs> great fun. Right. But the the probably the weirdest part of all of this is you know what. Here's a question for you. What's a control right now? What does it entail? As far as like to to, to log it? Yep. Yeah. I I, I, rec- I mean, I've been out of game a little bit, but I reckon it's a one sortie, one bomb, you know, one target, or, you know, something yep. like that. Yeah. Back in those days. So I'll preface this by saying I have almost 5,000 airstrikes. Okay. <laughs> because back in those days, you get a four ship of A-10s, they got two hours of play time. Every time you say cleared hot, that's a control. Okay. So... Four aircraft, four controls in the first thing, whether they're dropping weapons or not. They don't have to go back to the IP. There's not all that, all that. So now move that forward. So I had probably a thousand controls coming out of Carson and Korea. Now I'm up at Agos, and I, and I was doing a whole bunch of controls in uh, Kuwait and Iraq with the SF because I my initials were actually attached to uh, Udari Range for a while. Okay. Um, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you my initials are there, and you dial the number, and it and it shows up in the SFOB, and they would either route it to me or whatever, and I'd set up airspace scheduling because that was cowboy land out there. I mean, it was just freaking crazy. <laughs> we were doing Iris Gold rotations, and I'd go out there for like forty days. I'd roll up on the site, I you know, passing by one of the swarmer stands, I'd get a whole bunch of the swarmer bread and a jar of peanut butter. And that's okay. essentially my sustenance because I sure as hell don't want any MREs. But right. as the teams would show up, we'd rotate the teams through because they're off doing FID with some of the units. I'd join them later for FID, but it was, you know, the foreign internal defense part wasn't super interesting. <laughs> so I'd be out there in Udari controlling airstrikes essentially all day long. So it was like an MRE box. You know, I'm, I don't even have to look out of the vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I can do a control. Yeah. So I'd sit there, vehicles show up, they bring me either a new jar of peanut butter or whatever I'd ask for, you know, <laughs> crates of water. And we'd do airstrikes for like two or three days, getting these guys up to speed, and then they go back out to the unit. So it, you know, it was essentially, a, I won't say a stand about process, but we were thumping the living shit out of them to make sure that these guys learned what they needed to do sure. to do an emergency airstrike. Because there's only one of me out there, and all these guys are spread across the most of Kuwait and pieces of Iraq. Man. So it... it you know, it was it was one of those things, but we'd see, you know, sixty sorties a day for Jeez. when there was surge and when it, when a carrier would show up just after they got in, everybody has to do their surge at Udari. So I get a call. It's like, hey man, <laughs> we we need you out there. <laughs> like, All right, let's go. So I just sit there. You know, got a great tan. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I don't tan for shit. I'm yeah, Irish. but um. Yeah, it was great, great training. So, funny story. So, I'm sitting out there. The teams have left. I'm sitting on the hood reading a book. And uh, out of the corner of my eye, I see movement. You know, there's there's nothing out there. I mean, Udari is just a wasteland. Yeah. We bomb living shit out of it all the time, so nobody walks out there anymore. Uh, the soldier's walking up to me. American. And I look at him. I'm like, oh, you know, it's one of those. <laughs> what the f- <laughs> He's like, excuse me, Sergeant. Do you know Sergeant Klukas? I was like, yeah, I know Marty. <laughs> He's like, damn, everybody knows Sergeant Klukas. And he starts to walk off, and I'm like, where the f- did you come from? Yeah, wait a minute. What, like, why? You know, what do yeah, you, yeah, why yeah. do you ask? Where are you from? You didn't just drop in here to ask me that question. Where are you? Where, where are you from? 
He's like, oh, I'm from the, you know, the Ranger Regiment. Uh, we're doing some long-range patrol stuff, and we're set up over there. And I, and he points in the general de- direction of a blank freaking desert. Yeah. I'm like, well, you guys are doing good. You can see me. He's like, <laughs> yep, yep, we can see you. Okay, well, that just tells me, you know, <laughs> not to like pick my nose or something. I don't know. Right. But, but it was so funny because I'm like, it, you know, the, you mark it in a surreal category. It's like, sure. oh, yeah, I know. Sorry, um, I invited them over for lunch if they wanted to hang out, but. But, uh, yeah, it was one of those, it's like, what? Yeah. Stop time. What, <laughs> what was that? Such a yeah. small, not, not only is it the community small, but, like, the, just the the AO and just everything is small, you know? Like, you just never know who you're going to run into. And, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I'll periodically, I'm, I'm in Dallas uh, or near Dallas, Texas. So, periodically, I'll be driving around. I'll see someone with a either a Hawk, Falcon, or Eagle license plate. Sure. Or a tack key sticker on the back or whatever. Right. Yeah, it's a very small world. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Did Agos uh, got a whole bunch of controls there, and you know that the control numbers, you know, is what it is. Yeah. The uh, exit that, and Jimmy Felton had talked me into applying for the ACC requirements job. Okay. Um, at that time, the big push was to try to get technology in the field. We had none. Uh, we had an org that uh, Todd Armstrong had done. If you want a great interview, definitely talk to Todd Armstrong. Oh, he yeah, I'd love to. Drag. He, he wrote the original 1988 org that still is being followed nowadays. I mean, it's it was very – it had some long-range stuff on it. I probably wrote about 50 kind of deltas to it to, set, you know, to reduce requirements. Like at that time, it was okay for a computer to weigh five pounds. Yeah, right. What would you do if I handed you a five pound computer right now? I'd put it in my locker and not <laughs> use it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or you just say, no, I'm not accepting that. I'm not, I'm not going to sign a hand receipt. Right. Yeah. So at that time, technology, I mean, flip phones were brand new. So we were moving into a new whole, a whole new technology standpoint. Right. So talked to wife, accepted the position. And after that, it was, I was on roller skates across talking to everybody. So the way it's supposed to work is, a3, the chiefs over in ops are supposed to be handing me requirements, and I'm supposed to go handle those requirements. The problem was I was getting, I only had Todd's requirements document, which was great, but there was a whole bunch of stuff missing from it because the technology or the or the pathways that were there were not, were unknown. I mean, it was, you can't, you can't guess about this stuff. Right. So I started traveling around to the forts, and I, I think I hit just about every single fort in the U.S. and a couple overseas getting... First, you hand in my email and saying, hey, if you've got a weird requirement or something comes up, technology you see, let me know. Because I, I'm not, you know, I'm nepotent. I can't see everything, but I'm going to try to get you stuff. So this is in 2002 when I first got there. Okay. So I'm, I'm starting to get technology rolling. I'm starting to get stuff going. Uh, I'm working with software and hardware makers to get things. Uh, funny enough, two of the companies I ended up working for. Uh, when I exited, but the and now the technology is all together. Like Link 16 Terminal is made by the company I work for now. Oh, okay, uh, and all that stuff and the software is also made by this company because they bought the other company. <laughs> um, but so the the gateways and things like that. This was you know, harken back to time. You got a flip phone. You have no access to Link 16. Saddle is hard to carry and hard to use because yeah. the terminal weighs 35 pounds. All right. So we built the ground mobile gateway, a vehicle with a big grim van on the back of it with antennas. So you could come up on the, at, we were doing the original testing on HF. So you were getting data link traffic across HF. You just mm-hmm. dial over the frequency and you do stuff. The company I was working with, or the, yeah, the company that I was working with across the fence from me had already fielded that to the UK government, a methodology for their defenders to get link 16. They put it out on three or four different channels. You're a guy down range. You just dive over to it, and you can see an aircraft approaching via Link 16 across an HF radio, which is, okay. I mean, that's pretty epic. Yeah. A, a Link 16 terminal at that time weighed about 100 pounds and used 440. Okay. Uh, yeah, so not something you're going to carry yeah. on your back. Not mobile. Um, yeah, so all that traffic's moving around now. All that data's moving around now. Um, and we've got this now ground mobile gateway that when we went to the war, that's what was actually being used to pass Link 16 traffic out to the guys. So Link 16 is saddle traffic both, so you don't have to carry the radios, and we don't have to buy 10 million of those damn things. Right. I mean, our community had 550 vehicles. 
for 3,000 plus dudes that were in position. So uh, Gateway stuff sending things out. It stopped guys like Stinky from getting shot because, you know, Iraq. Um, so Stinky's out with one of the SF units, and they're within line of sight of Baghdad. Third, third ID is rolling down the road, shooting at every vehicle that looks like an enemy vehicle. All right. Stinky and, his, and the teams are in a vehicle that looks like enemy vehicles. Oh, so no. we linked them up via Link 16. So I'm sending Link 16 traffic to the lead elements of third ID, and I had them peel off a couple of vehicles, armored vehicles, and go over and meet with Stinky, link them up, and then roll them back into the uh, formation so that they didn't get shot. Because, you know, for sure, third ID was shooting at everything. Oh, everything. yeah. Everything. Um, there was a vehicle out there that uh, had so many holes in it, it was like Swiss cheese. It was just, you know, and, of course, they were marking a kill every single time. Sure. So. And the Air Force was doing the same thing by dropping hell, uh, fabric missiles into it and gun and everything else. So, yeah, it had been killed so many times. It was just <laughs> it was amazing. But uh, so I, I managed to get over for the fight. Uh, I told my boss I needed to hand deliver the equipment. Typical Romad thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, here's how we're going to do this. Um, so I deliver the equipment. And, of course, I have to stay around for a while, you know, just to make sure it's working right. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm there for the invasion. Um and all the pieces that went with that. And then finally my boss got back to me somehow. He's like, yeah, no, <laughs> your, your hall pass is revoked. Get your ass back here. We got shit to do. Like, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was general Don Hoffman, the mm -hmm. smartest general I have ever met in my life. Him and Petraeus are the same, are peas in the pot. Yeah. Because you talk to Petraeus and you, and you're talking about something, and then he gets distracted. He goes off and does something else. Three months later, he meets up with you and picks up the conversation in the same exact spot. Wow. Hoffman was the same way. Yeah. Uh, super brilliant guy. He was part of the original uh, IDM systems, the improved data modems on the F-16. Okay. So later, it, and that was at Aviano. When <coughs> I get to AC, I get to ACC, I start working for him. I find this out, and I had actually been on part of the test that he was on. So I was on the ground testing the IDM modem for the F-16s for our digital cast system. Let's see if this will actually show up. This was the beginning of digitally aided close air support. This is called the DCT. This I remember those. 19... I remember yeah, it. So yeah. <laughs> this was so far back. Uh, this was K-12 that was pushing this out to the field. So this thing here was the first thing that could do digitally aided close air support. It had a full nine line on board. And more importantly, it had the stuff that would allow you to do uh, uh, requests for support. I mean, the nine line simple. Yeah. It's the it's the 1972 slash 8001 that was the problem. So my major mission when I got into position was how do we do this digitally? Share the network because you know I've I've been on networks before with a lot of guys during an exercise, and it you know power trumps no matter what. But you still have to get a support for a whole bunch of guys. And if, and if there's a large fight running, how are you going to get assets for these guys? I mean, right. it just doesn't make sense. So I'd done the ASOC job uh, pro tem. It was one of those, hey, we need somebody to help us here. So when mm -hmm. I was at Carson, I went and supported that. And I saw just how bad that was of mm -hmm. you know controlling all the networks and all that. That was when we were still TASs, uh, 19th oh, yeah. and 20th TAS holes, what they called us. But the... Uh, <laughs> So when, so when I got in the seat, that was part of the things I tried to solve. And being a being an uber geek with regards to some of this stuff, uh, we're going to use the data links to do communication, and we're going to make our own messages up if we have to to do this. Mm -hmm. The DCT BCT was the foundational things for some of the stuff that going forward. You know, this this thing would hold like three nine lines and one J Tazer, I think. Uh, nowadays, you know, with ATAC, you can do a whole bunch more. But this was right. long before Android even existed wasn't even a thought in somebody's mind. We were still dealing with Windows tablets and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, everybody's like, oh, the equipment was so heavy. Well, it is now. You know, yeah, it may have been uh, three or four pounds back in the day. And, yeah, that doesn't compare with a phone now, but there's a time delineation here. Sure. But, so it was – the focus has always been how do I reduce the weight? How do I get things cleaned up so that a guy can go in, tap a couple buttons and be done? No typing right. anything. Everything's automated. Shoot a laser. It automatically fills in the field. Hit the button, transmit it. You know, that kind of thing. This simplicity is the is the most important piece of all of this. 
Definitely. So that, that, that's that been my focus with regards to DA cast. And I, and because we were so early in the process, ACC, myself, Jimmy Felton, uh, we even pulled in Todd, I think, for some of the conversations, were the guys that wrote the original doctrine documents for digitally aided closer support that, that were the foundation parts for 3-09.3 for the digital part. You know, we were like, hey, this is kind of where this needs to go. We worked with the Marine Corps because at that time I'm sitting at ACC um harris pitched us actually uh raytheon pistol so the the surefire radio mm -hmm. big satcom radio so that was pitched to us via powerpoint super dude named tony urenda walks in the door he's former combat controller from vietnam yeah. you know longoria uh sure yes i do i've had him on here as a matter of fact great yep. awesome guy longoria was his boss so right tony um Tony fostered a young Lieutenant Longoria. That's how far right. back that goes. So, <laughs> right, right. But Tony walks in, he's got the radio on his fingertips, drops on the table. This is the 117, does this, 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 and this, and this. We're all like, uh, is that real? He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can we have 500 of them? You're right. <laughs> so we got you're from right. the chat almost <laughs> immediately. It had to go through some Hanscom, you know, thrash, but it was essentially, this is the radio we got now. Bang. Out the door we go because we were yeah. we were solving so many problems, so much stuff that it just it was it was every single day was an interesting event. I learned so much about the acquisition system that I'd put a bullet in my brain and and threatened a new Hanscom. <laughs> That's how much I enjoyed that particular part. But the, <laughs> right. but dealing with all the new technology and seeing all the new things that weren't quite there. But they could, you know, I could give them a little bit of a, a slap and, and, and move it in this direction. Mm -hmm. Instance. So a guy named Mike Butler comes to me and says, I've got this new solution for communications. It's an XML schema called Cursor on Target. And so I start looking at it. And I'm like, dude, this is too big for my pipes. This is mm -hmm. like 524 bytes per message. Just to send the letter A, 524 bytes. Because it was all XML and it was all unpacked. Mm -hmm. I've been using VMF up to that point, link 16, 46 bytes, 47 bytes, very, very small to do the exact same job. I'm like, but I know some guys that could use this capability. You know, my networks can't handle it, but they have access to wider networks. So I called down to 720th and mm -hmm. said, hey, I got a guy I want you to meet. And that, that was the entry point for MITRE to get, because that's what Mike Butler worked for to get uh, the baseline communications up underneath what would then later be called uh, ATAC. Because okay. back then, even ATAC didn't exist. Right. So we're, we're dealing with these pieces, and it's like, hey, there, there's a there's a group of people that do things. And oh, by the way, let me introduce you to the guys at the KOC, because the KOC has FBCB2, FA TIDs. Um, let's see, at that time, there was all these monolithic monsters, TBMCS, these monolithic monsters that don't communicate with each other directly. They can't. It's just straight up impossible because we don't yeah. have the money to be able to pay that kind of bill to make your system upgrade to uh, 6016 or 6017 Rev A. I'm still in TIDP7, which was before it was called VMF. So and our systems are not compatible. We can't talk to each other. But we spent mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars building these monsters. And now you print it, you hand it to a guy, he walks over to the machine and inputs it. You've got error happening throughout the chain. That's not acceptable. Right. So I'm, I introduced him to the guys that run the KOC, the Falconer baseline at that time, uh, at both the air staff and at a couple other places, and said, hey, you need to, we need to get modules for this because you put a cursor on target translator on each item, now everything can communicate. It may not be the you know exact message and all that stuff, but it's it'll it'll communicate. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of that that foundational piece of how things work under there that came from discussions i was having a miter and all that kind of stuff we tried to do and to this day they still haven't kind of unscrewed that problem they're still sending full fat xml and that to me that's just retarded i've got this much bandwidth let's take and compress that thing because there's all sorts of neat compression that can work on xml and then shoot it across the radio I'm okay with that. Sending straight up XML out the door is dumb. That just makes no sense whatsoever. And that should happen on the radio, by the way, not on the compute, because right. you want it 
you know, you want the things arriving and unpacking and coming out. It's just, but that, that's never going to happen with the, the way the NSA, NSA writes their documents anymore. Yeah. Um, ACC was fun. Um, that was probably the busiest I ever was. Even SF wasn't that busy because it was every Jeez. single week there was something different. And I was always getting a call. Like I got a call from John Knife in theater and he's like, Hey man, I need this. It's like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> credit card, <laughs> I'll go get you stuff. Cause yeah. we rapidly realized we, you know, as a community, we have our areas that we live in. So if you're, if, when I got up to Fort drum, I got enough cold weather gear to support me for a lifetime. All right. Those guys that went into Afghanistan and Iraq did not have any kind of weather gear at all. So we were buying stuff right there on the spot. So General Hoffman gave me an American Express black card for a short period of time. Nice. I do mean short. <laughs> <laughs> I was going around buying everything with that. And, and you know, it's, you, you hold the card out and, you know, women's panties fall off. I mean, it was just an amazing <laughs> piece of kit. I, didn't, I had no idea about it. You know, I'm not not a financial master, you know, sure. but I go into the, um, the Blackhawk, the Blackhawk bag guys are down the street from me at ACC. So I drive directly down to their building and I'm, I'm just in BDUs. And, you know, I walk in and there's a girl behind the counter, a uh, young lady. And I'm like, Hey, um, I need 500 of those, 500 of those, 500 of those, 500 of those. And I just kind of go through everything that's on the stack. Right. And she's like, hang on a minute. Let me go get my deck. Older gentleman comes out, I repeat my request, and I'm like, and I'd like to look at your catalog and see what other things you might have that I can get. We're going to package this stuff up. It's going to go to Dover and be shipped into Afghanistan. And he's like, well, and he kind of gets that look in his face, and I hold up the card, and he's like, oh, have you met my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, uh, yeah, we met. Uh, he's like, would you like coffee? Because this is going to take a few minutes to pack up. I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. So she ended up having to go do a coffee run. While we're sitting there chatting and all his dudes are out packing everything up, we essentially cleared his shelves, sent all that stuff in. Um, it was a split shipment to Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and it was like, yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> but after that, it just became, hey, I'll just use the card. You know? Yeah. He, he pulled me in and he's like, uh, yeah, give me that back. <laughs> <laughs> Hoffman's a great guy. I mean, he was yeah. one of those guys that, you know, I, I'm sure you've briefed colonels and generals before where he's like, I have 10 minutes. And if you go longer than 10 minutes, he's walking up. He, he's, he's out. And yeah. Hoffman would do that every single time. He had His day was so packed. Uh, and because he lived on the installation, he'd actually ride a moped in. No shit moped. <laughs> so you have all these nice cars out there and motorcycles, and you got Daryl Hoffman showing up in a moped. <laughs> I think it was just kind of one of those... Me, what do I care? I run. The yeah, show. who cares, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nobody's going to bitch at me about it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he'd hold meetings, and you know, industry would come in, and they're talking. To, you know, this is the company, and here's how we're structured, and blah 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 blah. And they get to some point, and Hoffman looks at his watch, and he gets up, walks out. <laughs> that that's why nowadays, when I brief, because I brief damn near everybody, um, I leave all that company shit out. You don't care about the company. If, right. if you already, if you didn't already know the company, you wouldn't have called me in the first place. Exactly. So when I walk in the door, I'm not going to tell you how we're constructed. That's just a waste of time. Here's the product stack. Let's talk about some yeah. of the products that are most interesting to you. I briefed, I, th I think my best briefing was, um, and it wasn't even really a briefing, it was a drive-by, uh, Rumsfeld, um, uh, what the hell was her name? The, uh, shit, smartest individual I have ever met hands down. Damn, get her name. But I mean, she was worked on the Rumsfeld level uh, for the president. Uh, Bush did not come by. But what what got me? So Rumsfeld was using at that time. We didn't really know much about Blackwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, four Blackwater guys with him as security. All you see is shoulder head of them as they walk in because the the walls are not completely. You know, it's not, it's glass, but it's not complete glass. It's half half frog. Uh -huh. So you see these shoulders and heads come around the corner. And they come around. Here's this little dude in the middle. And I do mean he's like a little dude. <laughs> he can reach all at all. So I brief him and I brief a couple of uh, a couple of the other four stars. And they end up getting some of the technology that the TACTI community fielded for the wider force for, okay. for the other area. So, you know, GPS and compute. We were from a technology standpoint and even how we did business, the TACTI community has always been the most advanced. Now that's not so much 
anymore because other other guys have got more money suddenly and they're doing things. Right. But I mean, I was getting calls from at that time classified organizations saying, "Hey, what are you doing for this particular mission, or what are you doing for that?" I got a uh, so Secretary Roche at that time, Secretary of the Air Force, working for um, General Jumper. I get this phone call. I'm sitting at my desk. I'm not there very often. Yeah. But I'm sitting at my desk. I get a call, and it's like standby for Secretary Roche. And it's one of those. I look at the phone. And I'm like, all right, I'm being, I'm being screwed with. And I look around, and all the guys, none of the guys, nobody's on the phone. Yeah. And I'm like, what the hell? And then I hear his voice. And you know, I'm sure you're like me. Once you've talked to somebody, you've got their voice done and dusted. As soon as you hear them again, you know who it is. Sure. Well, I, I, you know, the training videos we get and everything for the secretary and his, you know, Christmas messages and all that. All yeah. Right. So this voice comes on, and he's like, "Hey, um, so." why aren't you buying rover systems i was like well i'm you know i've got to go through handsome i'm not usually funded for it we it's on our wish list he's like well how much would it take and because i have the wish list prepped i mean this was before the end of september so i had the wish list prepped so if any money fallout money came i knew exactly what it was part number the whole bit every superintendent and all that i think they do that even now sure but th that was so i had it listed i was like well the rover systems to get them all, I need $49 million. He's like, all right, what's your PE? 27423. And that's actually our PE. <laughs> and weird I remember that. But uh, it's like Rose is like, all right, I'll take care of it. And he hangs up. And I'm like, uh, uh, I call, first, first call is to General Hoffman. I'm like, hey, sir, I just got a call from Secretary Roche. Pause. And he's like, and what did he say? <laughs> He's going to buy me a bunch of rover systems for the boys. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Because, <laughs> you know, That's amazing. essentially, bottom of the food chain, top of the food chain. Yeah. No. So I call Hanscom, uh, who's handling our PE, our funding. And I'm like, hey, uh, stand by. We're about to get $49 million. <laughs> He's like, where from? I was like, just when you get it, look up all the numbers. Let me know when you get it. I get a call like five minutes later. He's like, what did you do? <laughs> you know, out of cycle funding from the secretary of the air force. Yeah. Jeez. I wondered, okay, how does he even know I'm there? And what would have right. happened if I'd not been there? And how did he get my freaking phone number on my desk? I mean, <laughs> right. Jesus. Yeah. But, uh, well, we were doing stuff. I briefed him. So here's, here's, probably one of the weirder stories. So, you know, right now we have guys going through the fighter weapon school and we have for some time. Okay. So a long, long time ago before me at ACC, somebody briefed having a next level training event for TAC East. So what did we have? We had the seven level course. Okay. And we had P PME. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Neither of them are going to help you be a better ETAC or whatever we were called at the time. None of that mm -hmm. helps you. So what we right. wanted to do we wanted to template the fighter weapons school and create a new one someplace else. It's got a, like a petting zoo. You know, have you ever actually touched a Mark 84? There's a lot of people that have never even seen one except when it explodes. Sure. Understanding what these things look like so you can have conversations with the army is huge. So we wanted to set up a full petting zoo. I had already, you know, kind of gotten with the MMS guys, munition maintenance and said, Hey, do you have some inerts? I need inerts of this, 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 this. And I went through a, a litany to include some of the air to air things. Um, but I, I wanted those things out in, in a room and we just call it the petting zoo. Here is the weapon systems that are available. That is right. the 30 millimeter, um, you know, crowd pleaser. That is this, that is this, that is this. So that's what I wanted to do. I talked to a three and they were all on board with it. General Hoffman got on board with it. We think this is a great idea. We'll put it someplace else. Um, you know, we'll put it down at one of the, one of the squadrons. We'll put it at the AGOS, uh, building down in Florida something uh no so we brief this thing and the briefing goes all the way up through the staffs everywhere so acc to the pentagon five or six different locations in the pentagon finally i'm sitting in front of sec roche general jumper was supposed to be there but he was way late so <coughs> we go and start the briefing because you know one guy works for the other in our our world so we brief secretary roche on the things that we wanted to do and we had a slide up that essentially said an enlisted fighter weapons school. And about that time, Jumper walks in the room. Jumper's a pointy-nosed pilot. 
He looks at the, the banner. He looks at us, states that the meeting is over, and to get out. What? <laughs> yeah. As I'm picking up my shit, because I, I brought the full kit. I had a ruck. I had armor. I had a, a dummy weapon so I could actually get into the Pentagon. Mm, um, all right. As I'm picking my shit up, he gets directly in my face, like, you know, knows away, and he says it would be a cold damn hell before an enlisted man goes through the fighter weapon school. Wow. He's a four-star general. He runs the Air Force. I don't want to be, you know, emptying shitters at Shimmy, Alaska. Yeah, so you're like, like Roger that, say, sir. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just stood there. He's like, get out. Roger that. Pick up my shit, and I go outside. He holds General Hoffman out. I get out in the hallway. I'm standing there for probably about 20 minutes. Um, Hoffman comes out, doesn't say a word. We head out. I grabbed a military vehicle to get up there so we could actually have good parking. Right. Throw my shit in the back. I'm driving out. Hoffman still hasn't said a word. We're about two hours out of, because it's a, almost a four-hour drive from the Pentagon down to Langley. Depending on traffic, it could be like 12 days. But <laughs> right. So I'm driving down, and about two hours out, he finally says, yeah, I don't think Jumper's a fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, well, hopefully there's no blowback on that. He's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. And, and that was it. Yeah. When we did get the course, because we put it in a couple times, waiting for different chiefs of staff to move on. Right. You know, if you don't, if, it's just like an ALO. You know, here's a good idea. Okay, now put it in a drawer. Next ALO shows up, you show them the good idea. You know, that right, right. We did the exact same thing at the senior leader le levels of the community. And <laughs> the day we had one, and, and the best thing ever was our guys were uh, honored, you know, honored as graduates. Mm -hmm. I, I texted at John Jumper. Must be cold in hell. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm did you get a response? There. I did not. Oh, okay. I did not. No, I, I and I fully didn't expect it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he's a fighter weapons guy or a, a pointy nose fighter guy, and he had the whole pointy nose fighter guy mentality, much like sure. you know Alos. I'm sure you work with. Yeah. Um, luckily enough, when the JTAC thing came around. And we were allowed to control without supervision. That changed the dynamics of how ALOs handled us. Right. Because we don't need them. We don't, we don't care whether they're or not. I've, I've been offered ALOs before. And, you know, sometimes it's went well. I, I'm still friends with a lot of the guys that I, I worked with in the past. Super, super cool guys. I exited in 2006. Stayed in the digital technology world. I was doing data links, Link 16 specifically. And VMF software. So it was all... Okay software pieces. In fact, some of the back end of the gateways and the airborne gateways are running. That's still the software, same software. So we put together a whole bunch of stuff in it, a bunch of my codes running there, a bunch of other code. And that's kind of where it's progressed uh, across time. As I've, I've kept my finger in poking and trying to get things, you know, hey, this dot needs to be connected to that dot because these, mm -hmm. these stories are related and there's a lot of tech that's in there. I mean, when's the last time you did an electronic warfare request? Yeah, Probably I don't think I've ever done one, yeah. Right. The 1974 or 5, I think it may have been a 5. 1975 form back in the day was to get a, a Phantom or something similar with an electronic warfare package underneath it. Well, that mm -hmm. stuff's coming back around because the Army is now spending tons of cash on electronic warfare gear. Right. So, because they're, they're trying to get up to speed. They've just been, they've been languishing for forever. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been... It's been interesting from a digital standpoint to see the technology move forward. I mean, phone does everything now. That's fantastic. Right. As opposed to big computers and all that. The uh, the recent stuff that's coming from the chief of staff that essentially says ATAC and WinTAC are the solutions. What are your questions? Mm. Those chief of staff of the Army. So I mean, it worked pretty well. Into, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, it's, it, the problem probably always happens. Well, here's an example. TBMCS made by a large defense contractor. There's a thing called CRs or write-ups against anything that's ever been built. So, you know, I want this to be blue. I want this, you know, here's these changes. I need these messages. You price those things out. To get TBMCS up to speed is $1 billion in write-ups. That's, that's not including any, you know, of the core. We need to maintain the core of it. That's just yeah. additional shit you want to add to it or changes you wanted to make it work better. $1 billion. 
So like Chi Gansberger, uh, you probably heard that name. Mm-hmm. So Chi, he was in the requirements position, like four or five positions after me. The first, the first guy was Todd Armstrong, then Jimmy yep. Felton, and then me, and then um, Blair Evans, and you know, there's a litany of guys after that. But the um, the technology as it's been going forward is getting bit sharper and faster. And we've focused on how can we get it to the field quicker without the big costs. And that's where ATAC and WinTAC help us because they're open source. Right. They're not closed, closed software like TBMCS and some of these other things. So like CPCE, WinT, and all these closed space, you know, it's great for co- you know, great for profit on a company because we're doing all the software development. It's essentially free. But uh, for the U.S. government, that's not a good deal because mm-hmm. – I want I want to fire you and I want to have a different company do it. Well, they dig into the code, you know, because we take the code from you and hand it to them, and they spend six months trying to figure out what the hell you built. Right. But if you're using open source software, which I'm a huge fan of and always have been from even back in the day, I mean, I had OS two running on a computer for a long time. the 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 thought process of being able to go into the code and take a look and see how it works is huge. Yeah. And from our community standpoint, that means we can go in and validate that the latitude and longitude and the lasers are working right. We can look at this stuff and say, yay, barely, I don't have to worry about dying. I did not sleep probably for the first three weeks of the war. I don't think I slept a single a single minute because I was so terrified of the, the cast software killing someone. Yeah. I mean, we put all sorts of limitations in it. You can't tap on a friendly and target them. You can't tap near a friendly and target them. You know, there's all these all these rule sets that were built into the software because I was nice. just clubbing the living shit out of the development team, going, "No, absolutely not. These things will not happen." Yeah. Um, that was the focus. So after you know, after that, it's like, okay, these guys are using the system. They actually did a, a voice off uh, airstrike, Link sixteen only, no talking. That was pretty cool. Yeah. But but it was the whole. It's got to be simple, and it's got to be idiot proof, and you can't kill yourself with it. And you can't right. kill other friendlies with it. That was that's the primary thing. And even now, today, the stuff I'm doing is in the same vein. So, a long time ago, getting data into a guy's melon required that you read it or you look at it. I got ATAC here. It's a picture. It's nice. I yeah. helped field the original ATAC. I helped get that to the field by providing funding and providing pushing and and stomping on people's heads that didn't want to go that direction. Nice. Um. But we didn't think about the second and third order of effects of guys looking down at their phone all day long. Right. And walking off a cliff. Or, it got to the point where guys, you know, enemy could walk up and stick a bayonet in your forehead and you can, we're not aware of it because you were paying attention to ATAC. Right, right. So what we're doing now from, from my standpoint, what I push now is what's called wave guide. It's essentially a piece of glass. I even kept one here. So it goes on your helmet and it doesn't show up very well. You can turn off that second again. Goes on your helmet, blip. You can control a drone with it, or you can do augmented reality with it. So now you've got the capability. You don't look down at ATAC anymore as you rotate your head around. The track's coming to your view. So know. now you can look out. You can't like interact with it by touching, but the turn my tumbler. Um, you can't you can't actually interact directly with it. But you can see it now. So as you're patrolling along, you don't have to stop and look at stuff to see what the battlefield's changed. You're seeing the battlefield in front of you. You're on. The, you're standing on the best one-to-one map that exists. So you know what else do you need? So yeah. sooner or later, maybe we we provide the capability of touching in space. But right now, we're just focused on getting it directly into your face. We're working with some guys behind the fence for their drone operations for this. And then we've got some other things going with regards to uh, simulated grenade launchers. So you can pull the trigger on a Mark 19, and a, you see the round go out, and you see it explode. But oh, like exactly, virtually. Yeah, yeah, nothing's happened in the real world. So it allows oh, cool. you to get that training. The We just talked to General Taylor, um, Major General Taylor, that came out of Irwin, recently out of Irwin. He wanted a capability to take his OCs and stand up on one of the hillsides and see the entire battle space. And we're like, yeah, we can do that now. You know, as long as guys are using something like ATAC to pass out Blue Force track, we can take that Blue Force track and stuff in your face and done. That's cool. So we've got demos coming up for that. But it's the, the, the thing of not looking down, not looking at compute, not focused off the battlefield is probably the most important part. And 
you can use this. You, you put your ballistic goggles on, standard Oakleys, whatever. You put us on the helmet lip, and then you have the panos that you fold down. So we're behind and amongst all of that. So you don't have to do anything weird to use the gear. Flip your panos up when you want to get under a rifle. You can use it with an ACOG. I've tried it with mine. Works fine. You know, it's, the track data is still moving around, and your brain just ignores what it should be ignoring. Our hmm. issue from a community standpoint has always been, how do I get the battle space into this guy's head? When I was out at Agos, that was the biggest thing was you need to understand the airspace. You need to understand where you're standing in the airspace and that over there is a is an artificial space that's in the sky. Field artillery is firing through. You need to keep mm -hmm. the jets away from that. And I've got helicopters over here below a certain altitude. You need to keep the jets away from that. So as they're doing business, now you got Predator and all these other yahoos flying through the airspace. So how do you control all of that? And used to be, I mean, when I was on Udari, it was a uh, MRE box lid. I had the, right. the airspace drawn, and, you know, here's how things are going. And, and periodically a tank unit would show up and start bouncing rounds across the range. But <laughs> it was it was the way we track data. My my perfect world is a set of these, and not necessarily us building. I don't care who builds it. But a set of these, you're looking out, you're seeing boxes in the sky, and you're seeing domes on the ground of JMIM's weapons effects. A Mark 84 is going to create this large of a circle. Strafe is going to do this kind of thing, and downrange is that. I, I want that where you can look out and see it. It becomes part of your metal task of understanding what's happening around you. Yeah. And half that data is not coming from you punching buttons into a phone or doing whatever. It's coming. Well, this we have the ability to see friendlies, like friendly locations as well. Yeah, so that way absolutely. you can yep. e friendlies easily the most important part. The yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah anti-fratricide has always been the focus. Um, I've been part of some... Um, Things that happened, like when Karzai got nearly killed by one of mm -hmm. our own weapon systems. Um, yeah. I was I was on the back end of that, not part of the actual investigation, but part of the technology that was being used. So I was being you know pulled into meetings and things like that with all these high level guys about the dagger GPS and if they had a fault and the laser systems involved and if they were broken. Blah 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 blah. Um, yeah. Turned out it was human error. I mean, that's literally right. where that came down to. But we've had all those things across time. I mean, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the guys were out using a GLID. Yeah, Bobby Taylor was out there using a GLID. And it, this was all new. I mean, you know, nobody had ever seen anything like this before. The paved penny pod on the A-10 picked up the most powerful emitter, even as it was coming in from behind, because there was a dust cloud or uh, dirt on the dome of, of the uh, laser emitter that caused a halo effect wrapped around it. It's like a big donut of energy. Uh, Pay Penny Pot picked it up to drop the weapon on. Luckily enough, they were standing, well, luckily enough for some, they were, they were on a hillside. So the weapon passed over them and then landed down in front where a lot of soldiers were sitting there observing. So it mm -hmm. killed a bunch of dudes. But things like that, we've gone across from a community standpoint, you know, I, I'm focusing on the tech, but from a community standpoint, the the fear I have always had is we use a tool and it kills us. Yeah, I, I never want that shit to happen. So I focus like like a religious zealot on things like that. We're going to feel this cool piece of tech. We've got ATAC on this phone. How can it not blow us up? Right. You know, what, what do we got to do to make sure this does not blow us up? Um, I used to say I that get... to my guy, when I when you give evaluations, when I instruct people, I'd like, it doesn't matter if you kill a thousand enemy if you kill one good guy, you you're defeated done. your whole purpose of being out yeah. there. Your whole point as a JTAC is to protect your force. And if you're killing any of them, then that's, you know, that's no good. So, um, I forget the year. I was at Agos. I just come in from a run. And I see a picture of Udari Range with some burnt vehicles on it. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I know who those guys are. That was yeah. Tim cruising out there. And one of the new guys, Jay Faley that I'd hired, I ran yeah. Jay's collection to get picked up. I'm, I'm immediately calling and asking questions. They're like, stand by, you know, a lot of shit's going on. They immediately put cruising on the grill. The good thing is because of how we operate and the way our community works, their stand eval documents and their evaluation documents are absolutely spotless because we have IGs that come through us all the time. And I was on right. the team for a while and it taught me, here's the things you need to look for. Here's the things you need to watch. So 
like when Tim came over to us at fifth group, because he, I think he was, was he my replacement? I forget whose replacement he was, but so we get him in. Failey's coming in. It was like Failey's first mission out mm -hmm. there. Um, so all their paperwork was absolutely pristine, untouchable. Where Lieutenant Commander Cunningham, funny that I remember his name after all this time, uh, his paperwork was not so pristine. But right. they immediately tried to blame cruising for the attack or for the for the brat. Uh, yeah, that you know, as a community we stood up and you know we fought that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, yeah, that was that was tragic. That was horrible. Well, and and every single time that happens, we all tighten up and we're all like, yeah, what's what happened here? So you know what happened out there with Karzai? What happened with cruising? All these different things. It it helped us. But man, it's a high price to pay to get help. For sure, definitely. You know, but they, but it's it's a testament to our career field and just how the guys that do what we do. We we learn. We definitely learn from that stuff. We take it to heart. We don't blow it off. You know, it's like that's yeah. It's a really hard lesson to learn, but it's also invaluable for the future yeah. guys. <laughs> so the so the first weapon landed actually on the vehicle that had the medic in the eighteen Delta. Jeez. So that wasted those guys, but the as I'm reading through all the different pieces of the report, um, one of one of the funnier parts was cruising realized what had happened as soon as the weapon came off the rails. Man, that's when he starts making the call. The he had one of the local jundies out there, and he was holding an islet, and the guy threw the laser, you know, threw the islet, thinking the bomb was going to follow it. <laughs> a little bit late for that, but if it was only. just yeah, yeah. Some of those stories you you see, it's like really okay. Well, <laughs> like you didn't really understand how that piece of kit worked, did you? College <laughs> like try, you <laughs> college try. Well, we had a dude. Yeah. He was one of our augmentees at fifth group. Um, they were using it as a flashlight, and the guy turned around, and pointed at his face. So the next thing we do, we get a call, and it's like, yeah, the guy's been evac to Germany because he's got a laser scar. Because it was a one watt yeah. laser, had a laser scar across his eye. Crap. Yeah, it's all training, training local forces. Yeah. Hey, going back to um, you were saying something about the the battle, the eight, the the glass. You were gonna. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have the ability? And this may be my ignorance, but do you have the ability to for a JTAC to have that view and have all the friendlies and all the you know weapons effects? Do you have the ability to send that to say a ground commander and say, hey, this is what I'm looking at. Here's the target. Can you do you approve this? Say they're not co-located for some right, reason. Right. So if you, if you follow the flow of data, we've gotten that data from U4 situational awareness and all these different data links that are being fed. Okay. So he's, he's as he should have access to those same things. If he does not, one of the things we're working on for this thing is to put a display on the back. We saw a different crew doing that where they can see what you're seeing. So what they're doing it for is, uh, you know, you're controlling a drone the boss wants to see what the drone's seeing. Well, you don't want to sure. take your headset off and hand it to him. You, right. know, you, know, you want to show it. The, the problem I've always had with all the tech, so all the way back to what used to be called Soldier 2000, I was part of that when I was a fifth group. They wanted some guys to go out and test this thing. And it was compute on your back. It was all these things, that, you know, optics, and I've got this camera that leads off my weapon site. And so these things have existed across time. They were just too big and clunky and painful to use. Fast forward to now, all that data is now available just on a phone. So if your right, ground right. commander has a phone, he can see all the same things you're looking at. We do not yet display in augmented reality because realize this is augmented reality you're looking at. It's Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. If you've ever played Call of Duty, sure, what you sure. see in Call of Duty is what you see in this. Okay. Minus, you know, the fake people running around. We don't have, right, we, right. Have, we have like fake vehicles we can drop, but that's, we're still experimenting with that. But so you're seeing this mill standard 2525 symbology out in front of you, tank, truck, airplane here's an airplane over here. here my friendly airplane and when you look at it it's got the call sign all the information about it showing so everything nice. you get out of atac goes to the screen when you look at the object so we'll show symbology but it's not we're not going to garbage up your display until you actually look at it you know I'm, okay. I'm looking directly at that thing here's some information about that latitude longitude altitude and how far away it is uh, the last i was just out of benning or fort moore or whatever the hell it's called <laughs> um the one of the one of the tracks I dropped was 600 kilometers away, but you can still see it in our display because I'd set it up so you could. 
Because mm-hmm. uh, usually we drop a rain train around, so you don't need to see anything too far away. You know, a train track right. maybe ten miles, so you see the airspace. Uh, and you know, standard infantry soldiers probably a couple hundred meters. You know, so you're you're in Fallujah, you can see everybody around, kind of thing. Um, but it was, it's always been how do you get data into your head and not overwhelm you with data? I mean, right. back in the day, I don't know if you remember Tacti Cass. Tacti yeah. Cass would pull in every single data link that existed and display it to you. And it was only in your zooming of the map that would change the amount of data you're seeing. So if you zoom way in, it only shows the things on that screen. The, it was clunky at the time, um, but the data happening underneath it was probably the most important piece because now you had access to everything that the planes could see and you could see, and you could get downlink video, it would show on the screen, and you could get the speed, most important part, since point of interest from the aircraft to the target. So you got a target out there, you sent the nine line to the airplane, and you can literally see what he's looking at. Yeah. A long time ago, like we're talking F-4s flying across the sky, you'd pass your nine line, you'd ask for a read back, and then you'd dig a freaking hole because you didn't know where he was going to be dropping that shit. You assumed he was going to drop it on that, but you never know. Yeah. I mean, you know, But now you can, yay, verily, see exactly where it's going to land. Yeah. If you look in time, I was at ACC when the F-35 and the F-22 were being uh, going through its requirements, validation, all that stuff, mm-hmm. before the aircraft even came out. My bitch at the time was they're not focused on cats. They don't have cats capabilities. They're not doing this. They're, you know, air to air, and, you know, I'm going to go shiny object, chase my watch around the sky, <laughs> whatever. But they just weren't focused. They call themselves, you know, all, what, you know, all level kind of weapon systems like no you're not you're no. you're not putting link 16 on board some of these platforms so how do i talk to you you don't you have metal and these other things that i can't get on the ground because right. you know for various reasons it's like come on man mm-hmm. so as time has moved forward thankfully enough those things have had you know updates but the thought because realize the timeline we're dealing with here some of these old crusty guys have been around since the vietnam era and not long after their comment was you know i don't need to do any of this digital shit I'll, i'm always gonna you know capture it with my eye and look at the target and i'm gonna go clear it off mm-hmm. and i'm and i'm talking to them i was like no they're gonna sling weapons from 30 miles away across the horizon to you because they're not capable of going through the air defense net they're right. going to be dropping from thirty-five thousand feet you can't even see an airliner at 35,000 feet, much less a small little tiny airplane. But of yeah. course, you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. So sure. <laughs> so what I focused in was how can I force this digitally and help the young guys that are coming to be able to get the data to what that thing's doing? Because, I mean, yeah. it got to the point during the war that the guys could essentially, you know, aircraft is taking off from wherever, coming off the carrier or whatever. Send them the nine line now because it's going sat bouncing off the gateway and the gateway was feeding the networks. Aircraft's got the nine line before he's even got wheels in the well. He's coming towards you. You can have a digital conversation with his ass and right. you can have all these airplanes show up. I mean, it's, it's great because I'm, I'm a big fan. So digitally aided closer support, not digital cast, not sure. a fan of digital cast. Digital cast is completely voice out. I am not a fan of that. Yeah, I'm not a fan because I want our guys to talk to the pilot. I want Southern twang, you know, Northern twang, whatever. I want the <laughs> talk, the conversation going on between you and them, because right. that lets them understand that there's a human being at the other end of this thing. Always want the guy to sling in a weapon off to understand who and what he's talking to on the ground. The, the level point. of, um, you know, the, the essentially, I, I understand the battle space. I'm on the ground. I understand the battle space. I'm not in fear. I'm not freaking out. I'm I'm a professional. Mm-hmm. Come and come and give me some bombs because you're just a li- the delivery boy. Right. You are bringing me right. a truckload of bombs. I want that truckload of bombs like this over here, 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 and here. And then I want you to come back and talk to me again, and we'll drop in some more places. So it's I've I've always been a fan of our guys are super smart. We understand how the Army and the Marine Corps work. We understand how all these systems work. Planes come over, they drop a weapon, it lands where we want it to go at the time. So it's yeah. always got to have our guys super smart in the weapon systems and the platforms. And that's why I wanted the petting zoo at the, you know, the, the new JTAC course. Um, it's just, you know, our guys are super yeah. smart 
and I want to enable them more. And, that, and hell, they're even smarter now. I mean, oh yeah. Back oh, when I went through sure. SF, um, it was you know you break something, you know, take, take a couple of days off. Here's some Motrin. <laughs> right. Now they've got you know nutritionists and psychologists, and they're they're Olympic style athletes now, which is yeah. amazing. It's fantastic. It's really they're great. All smart. Yep. Yeah, they're it's all really awesome. Smart. Yeah, yeah. Which but kind of goes back to your point, like you were saying uh, that um, you know people were kind of uh, apprehensive about the technology part of it. Now it's almost the other way. It's a come. It's kind of one eighty out now. They they're really dependent on it. I'm not saying they can't do the other stuff, but sometimes I mean we were talking about the other day. These guys are so busy and they're just so much to learn. Yep. Sometimes that 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 um, that old stuff gets lost. You know, like ma- map and compass or anything oh, yeah. like that. Sometimes so, you don't have you just don't have the time to do that kind of thing. You know. Well, John Babcock, if you know that guy. Yep. Yep. Over the top dude. I mean that that he is the coolest guy ever. Um, he came up with a Project 275 and he ran in the National Guard. And it was, you've come through, we're going to send you through this either before or after the tech school. You're going to go in there, you're going to learn everything. We're going to run you through, and, and it's not cats, it's map and compass, how to build an antenna, how to operate this radio, how to do all these things. It was all the ground things, how to understand yeah. the symbology, how to understand the rank structures, all that shit. And, and then cast at the tail of it to get him the feel. Um, John did epic Gilman's work there. And I, and I don't know if some of that was foundation for the new course. Uh, I'm hoping I volunteered to go out and see the, for the union coming up. I'm sure uh, you're going out there. Uh, I, would, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. Uh, November yeah. 1st and 2nd. Yeah. Try, try to block it. Up. I, I try to go every year and I went to the, the schoolhouse for graduation of Hawk 118. Wow. A <laughs> hundred classes after me, Jesus. But um, just to see how much of those things we learned before get pulled into the new training. Yeah. Because we've learned, you know, hey, this is probably a better way to get this guy up to speed and then run him through. And I think that's some of where the pipeline now comes into, which is mm-hmm. epic. I'm glad those pipelines are merged because yeah. we were all teaching redundant shit. And that just, yeah. It, it, it also ties our communities together a lot more. Before there was a lot Definitely. of animus between us and combat control. Yeah. Uh, not so much the PJs, but us in combat control, there's a lot of animus. And, and I think a lot of that's gone away now with the new crew. Because okay. we're all training the same place to start with. Mm-hmm. A, a huge differential. Huge difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, did you want to talk about, uh, I see some, some a Bosnia story on here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, well, it was, um, so two different pieces. We figured out that we weren't allowed to do the tiramisu before mission because there was so much alcohol in it. That was because we, we were staying in a, a house. I was wondering what that meant. <laughs> yeah, we were staying in a local house. Uh, and this nice lady, and I wish I could remember her name because she was just amazing. So every time we showed back up from doing a mission, pre mission, whatever, no matter what time, there's food. Yeah. Lots, lots. Pasta from hell. I mean, oh my God. Nice. Um, but the tiramisu she brought out, when she bring it out in a huge cookie sheet, huge, one of the big cookie sheets, and it would be waving. Because it had so much alcohol on it to bottom. So we weren't allowed to do that prior <laughs> mission. It was only after. But but an adjacency with regards to militaries. So me and one of the other guys, um, when we first get in there, they're like, we're going to start your combat pay. We're going to put you on this on this flight. And it was a British uh, tanker. They, they fly into the airspace, come across, and that allows us to start the trigger for your combat pay and, and all the other things. Oh, okay. So me and, me and this guy, and I wish I remember who it was because – we're sitting there, and it's a comfy pallet bolted to the floor. They'd just done an air refueling event, um, and their air refueling controller is actually in the front. He doesn't sit in the back. But this this young female walks up. She's like, you know, she has no pad in her hand. She's like, what do you guys like for dinner? And we're looking at each other, and, you know, it, you, you climb on an Air Force aircraft, they throw a box nasty at you. Right, and, right. Yeah. <laughs> if they <laughs> so do this that. Was, that I mean, yeah, this was, yeah, this was a completely weird event. You know, this. she's like, what would you like? We're like, well, what do you what do you have? And she started going this litany of things that she could provide. So we we kind of make our list, and and the guy next to me, uh, is making his order. We'll call it. Crew door opens up. Pilot walks out, smacks her on the ass, and says, "What's for dinner?" What? Oh yeah. my god! I'm sitting there. I'm like, I'm uh, about to be part of an investigation. I know yeah. it now. <laughs> oh my god! You just you don't touch a female airman. <laughs> 
period. Oh died. my gosh. Yeah, it was one of those, well, we got our combat pay turned on, and we also saw something extremely weird with regards to the services. So, yeah, that was, uh, but we got our old days, man. Oh, <laughs> old, yeah. old days. Yeah, well, I don't, I, you know, I still deal with a lot of British guys, mostly from the SAS standpoint, but they're, I don't know that much has changed there. I really don't. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Different culture, I guess, you know? Yeah, well, from the aviation industry, yeah, absolutely. They yeah. they they were way different, way different. I don't know. <laughs> so tell me about the, the Philippines uh, story. Uh, yeah, so I got tagged, and I'm trying to remember. I'm going to leave the year and all that stuff out per our previous comments. Sure. Um, someone had shot at one of the SF advisors. And killed him. Oh my God. Uh, we showed up. I was tagged to a SFODA. Um, keeping in mind that happy hour starts at 5 p.m. Very important. Yes. So, and this was when Nipa Hut, Fire Empire, and all the great bars existed right outside of Clark. And it was okay. like right outside the fence, not on that side adjacency. It was literally right outside the fence. You could see the bright, pretty lights from the fence line, which was okay. nice. So we're a little bit further down in an area called Kappa Starlack. And we went hunting and it was essentially, we're going to roll these guys up one at a time and mm -hmm. one's going to lead us to another, another, another. So we were doing that, but, um, <laughs> five cockerels around, we're pretty far. So there was a whole lot of hunting that did not happen because we're at the bar. Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> about 20 years later, I show back up in the Philippines for a reunion amongst some guys that still live there. And there's this guy down the table, a local. Um, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, man, that guy's super familiar. You know, what team was he on? Because there was a whole bunch of guys. There were they essentially grabbed <coughs> SF dudes from across the across the Pacific Rim to go in there and do this. And you know, everybody was kind of diverse and different different things that were going on. Mostly first group, but you know, it was all these different guys. And then me and a Marine Corps liaison guy. Okay. Um. But I'm looking at this guy, I'm like, what the hell? So I ask him, and he actually helps. And he's like, you're, you're looking at me like you know me, but you probably don't. He said, you probably saw my picture on the wall. I was one of the guys you guys were coming after. I'm like, really? And, and I'm like, he's at a reunion for this? And what the? He's like, yeah, well, after a period of time, my wife said I can either stay with her or I can keep fighting, you know, AK-47 style, blah, blah, blah. He said, so I, I stuck with her and I joined the Aquino regime. The, essentially the bad guys that were fighting. <laughs> he said Jeez. it paid better. Yeah. Like, Hell. But yeah, it was uh, it was kind of cowboy land. Um, wow, we went that's out crazy. hunting dudes and it's like we're gonna make a point. You can shoot anybody you want, you just don't shoot at our guys. Period. Sure. And it was actually their guys, the SF guys. But yeah. Yeah. That was uh it, it, it's one of those experiences you you're like, Man, that was kinda surreal, did that good thing I had some photos, or I Yeah. I think, yeah, no. Nah. Well, I mean, so was he worried that you were going to like pick well, up where he, you left off? And he was too far away uh, when we were quitting because we we patrol from you know late night till early morning, long enough for us to go back get showered and then we could go to happy hour. Um, <laughs> he was far enough away where he was outside of that data loop, so oh, we okay. drive out to a point and there's only so far you can go, you know, in a distance in a time. So. Yeah. He, he said, yeah, he said, I lived about five minutes outside of the ring that you guys were doing. He said, we always Lucky knew where you were, though, because the, the locals would talk to each other and say that, you know, all the hunters are over at the Nipa Hut or Fire Empire. They didn't come yeah. after us because they realized what would happen after that, because then a the larger force would show up and freaking delete all of them. But it was right. just, you know, the, the snatch the guy, we'll talk to him, snatch another guy, we talk to them kind of thing. It was the SF guys were having a blast. Let's put it that way. Sure. They were having a really good time. Because they essentially. But like you there. said, that's kind of like the Wild West. It was like back then, it, I mean, I'm sure it's similar now, but that you it's you got to get the mission done. You know, you do what, what's necessary. And Yep. Well, rules. and this was before lawyers were involved. I was going to say rules are kind of like rules yeah, of engagement your own discretion. And, yeah. The, well, yeah. The, the rules of engagement uh, for that particular thing was um, the weapons of choice had to be below a certain size, no 50 cals, nothing like that. We were, we were out there to capture and make a point, not terminate with extreme prejudice, you know, entire family groups sure. or shoot through trees. Cause that, that area is pretty sparse. 
You could yeah. fire a fifty cal and, and it'd go a mile before it literally hit something to slow it down enough. Because right. the trees were out there were pretty weak, but it was just to prove a point to them. It's like, look, you're not untouchable. We know where you are, and we will yeah. come and come and get you at your house. Don't ever shoot at our people again. Uh, Nick Rowe is the guy's name, Medal of Honor runner, and he gets smoked by some shithead on the back of a motorcycle driving by. So we got we got both of those guys. Uh, in fact, a different agency went and got those guys. But that yeah. essentially pointed us to all the other things because we were actually led by other agencies, not you know, the U.S. Army was involved from an informational standpoint, but I don't think anything else was. <coughs> only anything else was moving around out there. Yeah, but it was pretty, it was yeah, different. Pretty standard stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of those missions like that. When when I was in Kuwait doing an Iris goal, second one maybe I don't know. We get switched on. So intelligence is detected. Uh, you know how Cobar tires happened? I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I, I'm familiar with the situation. So it was a van loaded with explosives. Okay. Parked up against a um, cinder block wall. The cinder block wall became a Claymore mine when that thing detonated and it took the entire front end off of a building. Jeez. So now change that paradigm to a tractor trailer. And it was coming to Doha. So you've got a lot of folks there at Doha, uh, an entire Special Forces battalion or company was there. Uh, Marines, Air Force, everybody was at the Doha facility there just off the shipping point. Yeah. We had a couple of dudes down the street, local forces that were cops. And that was very, you know, we were very safe with that. Mm. Uh, but somebody <laughs> had detected a tractor trailer loaded with explosives, a potato truck specifically. And it's got a potato symbol on the side of it. Yeah, loaded to the top with explosives, you know, blue barrels, wires, the whole, the whole thing. The only possible place they could go to make a statement would be Doha. So we immediately got alerted, and now there's meetings in the evening. Um, man, what was that major's name? We had a the the company I was with, uh, ODB five ninety, major in command, and you know all the teams that we've been out there doing our goal with. Next thing we know, helicopters are arriving with a whole bunch of other friends. So some SEALs showed up. Some guys from behind the fence showed up with beards. A lot of help showed up to do stuff. And we all got switched on. So, of course, you know, standard SF. What's the first two things you ask for? Uh, relaxed grooming standards. Relaxed uniform. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so, so that happened, like, instantaneously. But our meetings in the evening were a whole bunch of weird forces. And then a phone line open to the situation room at the White House. So not one of those ones you fart in or, you know, you make stupid comments in. But that, right. so they were monitoring. I don't know who was at the other end. I mean, it could have been anybody. But um, all our meetings were actually monitored by different agencies. So we had guys in suits show up. And there was, there was a whole bunch of folks over there. Yeah. The, the problem was how do you attack a vehicle like that? So immediately guys were out searching a helicopter because what actually tripped us on was that the tractor trailer left. They couldn't find it. So the assumption Jeez. was it's in route. So we got to find this thing and stop it. Somebody did the math on it. The crater it would create would be almost a mile across in the detonation. Unknown depth, but just because of the way the ground is made, you know, somebody did a salinization, whatever. Yeah. You know, a bunch of sciencey shit happened on the whiteboard. All right. The, the explosion, they, they figured that the, the, Engine block would probably go about six miles in the air, like a cannon shot. Jeez. So we're all sitting there in a room uh, from a team level standpoint. We're, we're figuring out how we're going to engage this damn thing. And guys are like, well, we can hit it with a Barrett. We can go for the driver and hit it with a Barrett. So if he's sitting on a, a switch, it detonates. It's out there. And, and I'm like, how far does a Barrett shoot? <laughs> you're you're going to be inside the frag pattern, dude. <laughs> yeah, <all> right. <laughs> so I, I I then bring in the Air Force thing. I'm like, look, I can drop a JDM on this damn thing. We can shoot it with an A10 from a couple of miles away. We can delete yeah. this thing. But of course, you know, the Army wants to take it on. Sure. Sooner or later, you know, common sense prevails. It's like, all right, as soon as we find this thing, we're going to call Charlie and, and we're going to go get this thing. Because I was the only JTAC on staff. They brought some guys in from the 6th SOS to help with regards to getting some of the local forces done and all that. Um, mm -hmm. But it was one of those, it, it was pretty wild. And 
about two weeks later, we're still in this mode of, you know, it's 24 seven operations. Guys are out. We're trying to find this thing to fly in all the road routes, looking for a, you know, looking for a potato truck. You'd be shocked. Mm-hmm. The number of potato trucks actually on the road. They would land in a military helicopter, get off in a pair of blue jeans and a shirt. Cause you know, we had relaxed uniform standards. Sure. <laughs> Not giving away completely who we were. Right. <laughs> They'd run over and they check, you know, they check license plates because we knew the plates. We knew everything about this vehicle. We knew what the guy looked like. So we, we kept looking for this guy. Never found him. After a couple of weeks, they found the truck parked elsewhere doing nothing. It was just, they checked it. The explosives were still in it. Really? The driver was nowhere to be found. You know, the, there was all sorts of supposition going around about you know, what happened. Maybe the, Maybe one of the intelligence agencies shot the guy that was going to be driving or whatever. But we got we got told to stand by. We were probably we were still in a extreme mode for about another month because those rotations were 90 plus days across. Yeah. And the the army in its infinite wisdom would do 90 days, bring you out for two weeks and give you another 90 days. Why would they do that? So they don't have to give you a short tour. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> Bunch of still lame. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it it just meant that we went to. Uh, I think we went to where were we? We were somewhere in Spain, and I don't speak the language at all, even though I'm born Spanish. Um, uh, my extent of Spanish is the Taco Bell menu. I, I understand that <laughs> too. Well. But we got so drunk that they were picking guys up and dropping them at the front gate, and then the, the cops out there just leave us playing. So you got you got. Four or five, yeah, it was five special forces detachments of twelve ish guys each in mounds out in front of the <laughs> place. Um, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. sounds they all right. Us, they sent us right back in, but you know. Sure. Well, uh, do you have any like um like initiatives that you're doing? I know there obviously, you know, romad.com and joint term attack controller.com is awesome and that's a just a great initiative and a great effort um but as i give the guys the opportunity to kind of talk about anything else that they're you know um yep you know passionate about or into so romantic.com still going uh it doesn't of course have the impact that it used to have like you saw back in the day uh because right. facebook was far supplanted and and good on facebook the problem with facebook like i mentioned earlier was timeline you put something on it and it's gone 30 minutes later so i am I'm historically storing things so that people, so it stays around. That includes okay. pictures and things like that. So if I see something on Facebook, I'll drop it onto the Romain.com system, not necessarily available on the internet, but you know, I've got it down there for historical purposes for photos that get published out and things like that. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of what I do in my spare time. I help uh, game companies. I'm a, a, I won't say a certified tester, but I am a certified software beater where I'll go in and and do whatever software you're talking about. And I will club it and look at the edge cases. That was part of my primary thing doing all the software across time for our community. What's the edge case this guy could do that would cause it to freak out, do something wrong. Like if he holds it upside down and he's doing jumping jacks, can he press a button and it does something weird that we did all of that kind of corner testing. In fact, most of our testing was the corner case, stupid shit. Um, to, to to make sure our software didn't kill somebody. I got you. So I do the same thing with like games and and you know database apps and things like that. Now, where some will call me and say, "Hey, can I do this?" I don't do it for money. I do it for the sheer uh, interest of the digital technology. Uh, and oh that, yeah. And that led to what I'm doing in the company where I've been. I was part of the data links division. Um, we fielded Firestorm, which was essentially the TACPCAST system advanced with a bunch of changes for smaller platform hardware and it was sold as a kit. So okay. you're Belgium, you don't have a big acquisition arm. You order Firestorm system number one that has, um, it has a GEMLR long range laser range finder. It has a PLR 15 at that time. It has GPS, it has compute, it has power, it has all this stuff. You buy it as a kit and we would sell it as a kit. So we ended up selling close to 3,000 of those systems because Belgium, Germany, Australia, Estonia, um, I know I'm missing, there was, there was 15 nations, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, there was 15 nations that fielded this for all their JTACs. Oh, okay. 
So literally, you could fly somewhere like you go to Bold Quest, and the guy next to you has the same system you have because we nice. were the primary system for a very long time. The company, I've been screaming about ATAC for a very long time. ATAC is coming. We need to be prepared. The company didn't want to go that direction, so we kind of got deadlined. We missed the boat uh. straight up. Um, we did not. We cannot pivot. And to be perfectly honest, a large company cannot pivot like that. Okay. We can't. Our guys, you know, we we charge too much for our engineers for them to be working on an open source piece of software called ATAC. Gotcha. And literally, I'm paying the guy two hundred two hundred dollars an hour to do work on something that I can hire a college kid for zero dollars, and he'll just do it for the fun of it. So right, that's, right. that that's kind of where that went went down. So Firestorm you. is essentially gone now from the community. Everybody's using ATAC, which is great. Yeah. Um, and then the smaller lasers and all the new th stuff that's coming out. So that's my primary focus is getting technology to our guys and to the Army guys and the Marine Corps guys and all this, uh, U.S. and outside, um, to make sure that fratricide doesn't happen. Been too yeah. many funerals, seen too many no things, um, you know, I seen too many stupid shit. So literally, if I can get technology in your hands, maybe clunky, clunky at start, but we can work together to make it better, that that's the that's the focus of what I've been doing my entire career, truthfully, since since I got to since I got to SF actually back in those days. It, it yeah. was just trying to get the better technology in the hands of everybody to make sure that we don't you know, number one, why should I have to stick my face around a corner when I can stick <laughs> right. with my my weapon around the corner and have the scope see everything. I mean Right, right. You know, that helps greatly. Same thing with sniper systems and all that stuff. So, yeah, sure. that's that's been my focus. Romance.com still in the background, but you know, mostly trying that's to get awesome. technology in everybody's hands. Yeah, safely, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and and it's not even our technology. I don't care if it's from Collins Aerospace or you know, Elbit. I don't care if it if it's a if it's a game changer and it changes the way the world works and makes things better for our guys. I I recommend buying. We. We build a lot of cool stuff, and since we got bought by Raytheon, the cool stuff list got really, really big. Uh, oh, but nice. there's a lot of other pieces of gear out there that are really, really great. That you know, Ed Shulman's doing some great work out there with, with technology. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of dudes out there doing great work with technology. So, I every chance I get, I kind of push them and say, "Hey, you know, you should try this. You should." I, I did a connect yesterday with a guy that's making small uh, IMUs for helmets. So now okay. a very small um, six-off sensor, as you rotate your head around, I know where your head's looking. That tells me in the display is what I put up there. It also provides things for training. You know, what, what's this guy looking at while he's out training? So the basic course oh, can cool. put something in. It's like, what were you looking at? You know, you're supposed to be you're sweeping the battle space as you're looking. You were looking down at something. What were you looking down at? You check yeah. your Facebook page, you know, whatever. Uh, looking <laughs> right. at Instagram. You know, really, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's the telltales. You know, it's how do I get... How do I help the guys get better by breaking the paradigms that they're currently inside? Of? So, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, look, Charlie, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here, man. And this is great. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Wish my camera worked better. That's the company laptop for you. Uh, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> if you have, and this is kind of like, kind of just me, for me, you know, I work in, I work with the community a lot still. So if you have any updates, keep me posted. You know, I, I'd love to, Good. you know, stay networked with you. And yeah, Do you have a lot uh, app agents up there? Uh, we do have the ability to hook it up. We got a J10 connection that yeah. people can bring in faith. We don't have, really have any equipment to get, you know, all the participants right, right. bring it in. Well, so so the that's probably going to be one of the few command and control systems that survives. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Yeah, because it's the, there's two networks or there's going to be two networks. I'm waving my fingers in the air with two, but um. <laughs> So the standard army, um, sensitive but unclassified on a mesh network. So the reasoning for man packs is kind of going away with regards to most of the people that RTO will still have one and right. we will probably still have it, but that's kind of a, an adjacency. So sure. you got all these army dudes on ATAC and then WinTAC up at the higher levels. They're going to amalgamate and they're going to put tax servers throughout the entire chain, but it's going to be sensitive but unclassified on okay. our side of the fence. Us and the JFOs and the Intel guys are going to be on, um, type one mesh that has all our stuff in. So we can send, you know, fire missions and all that kind of stuff across. Um, so that that's the two breakpoints. So what you're going to end up with though, if you, if you're paying attention to the, to the tune is that we don't have a direct connectivity radio wise with the army ground commander that we're standing with. I can stand right. five feet from you. I'm in type right. one. He's not. 
So what they're doing is they're putting a cross domain guard at the very top. So when you communicate with them, it's going to go up and then back down, which is not optimal. There's a bunch of companies looking at putting cross domain guards throughout the chain. So now mm -hmm. my stuff can talk to your stuff, your stuff can talk to my stuff. Um, just from a Blue Forge situational awareness standpoint. Well, I mean, I never really understood that. Like we're, we were doing stuff for instance and yeah. they were like well this they what they're using is not the same thing as this guy what we're using right. so how do you know and we're on chat and but it's like it, it, it just <laughs> seems so crazy how we're, the dod doesn't say look this is the radio you're using this is the this is the whatever you know what i mean yeah. like i don't yeah. I, I don't understand yeah. why they don't just use the same stuff so they tried to do that a long time ago when i was at the staff admiral gian bastiani was over at joint forces command admiral g was a big uh, interoperability guy yeah. The problem was, um, I'm pretty sure he was borderline psychotic, but he, he, <laughs> he'd jump up during staff meetings and shout and, and you know, get really, really energized. And yeah. people were like, you know, lean back in their seat like, it's, you know, is he going to go crazy and kill us or what the hell? But he's, <laughs> right. this, he's this big Navy admiral. And um, his big push was, give me Title 10, I'll fix this problem. He had yeah. Title 10 for like three days before the Pentagon pulled it back up. And said, you don't get Title 10, we get Title 10, we'll help solve this. They never did. Yeah. Uh, but Admiral G had a great plan. And now the Army Chief of Staff is leading the way in getting rid of a lot of that non-interoperability. The, the great thing about data links is that um, they have specs and standards. The bad thing about data links is everybody has a modification to spec or standard. So right. while my system speaks one version of VMF, yours speaks a different, they're not interoperable. That's what uh, I'm saying. It's crazy. Yeah, only Link 16... And some of its, you know, messages is interoperable with all different versions because it's based in hardware, not in just messages. So, yeah. but VMF's got all these mods and things they're doing, and they've even fielded a mod that didn't work because the guys who were writing the spec ran out of money. I shit you not. That's an actual thing that happened. Uh, it literally broke all the segmentation reassembly stuff. It, it broke everything you could do in imagery. It broke, it, it broke a lot, but... They got extra money and they finished it, but it was still, that's why you have a VMF D and then D change one. That was that thing. D came out broken, change one, they fixed it. And it's like, okay, that's stupid. But now you have, you know, what's the F35 going to install? You have to do something where you can talk to the F35 digitally. Sure. Plus I've got the Apaches that are different and I've got, yep. you know, all these other platforms that are different, but link 16 absolutely works every single time. No problem. Uh, we tested that. I sat out at, uh, the base out in California for like a month and we did, you know, send message, send message, send same message, change a yeah. character, send a message. What they were trying to do is make sure that what the guys built in the airplane work with the messages we sent. Okay. Did it match? Um, link 16 is pretty straightforward, but some of the other message sets are not. So it was literally tested, tested, tested. We were fielding firestorm to the UK guys at the time. So we ended up getting some UK JTACs in. And we had them sitting there with us doing it because their F-35s were being worked on, built. Okay. And they were getting those F-35s, so they wanted to test those planes. So we used it as a testing event for all of the stuff. You know, how can we nice. test this and this and this? And this? But, yeah, if you've got F-35s up there and you've got a digital capability, you can talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right, Charlie, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot for coming on. This it was really awesome to talk to you. Very cool. Well, all right, uh, I'll, I'll go. Um, if you have any questions or questions that you know get submitted to you, I mean, my, my email is charlie at .com if they want to hit me up directly. or Okay. Bring it on. Sounds good. Cool. Thank you, sir. All right, man. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Yep, no worries. Take it easy. Hey.